For some that subscribe to a Cold War view, the current conflict is the result of a great game between the US and Russia. NATO is the prime cause of this horrific conflict in some people's minds, and for others, it is the result of a global industrial military complex that feeds off conflict and chaos. But for Ukrainians, it is a fight for survival. They tend to see Russia as a local imperial aggressor. Today, I am unpacking these interpretations with Yohor Bralian, journalist and expert on colonial history. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce. It will really help to increase the popularity of our content in YouTube's algorithm. Our material is now being made available on popular podcasting platforms as well, such as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Yihor Bralian's areas of expertise are colonialism, the international history of the 20th century, British history and politics, as well as security in the media. He is special correspondent for Army and Form, covering international security and defense corporation of Ukraine, together with military aid and the phenomenon of multinational military units. He also covers the Ukraine-NATO relationship. He has also worked as a journalist at the Ukrainian TV station 24 Channel. He has a PhD in history and wrote his thesis on British colonial and post-colonial policy in the Caribbean colonies. Welcome. Hello, Jonathan. Now, we've got to start with current events. And of course, the big news of the last day is the death of the first and last president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. He will not be mourned in Russia as much as he is in the West for his role in the breakup of the Soviet Union. But do Ukrainians have a different perspective on him? Uh, first of all, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev is remembered for Ukrainians uh... First of all, uh, regarding the Chernobyl catastrophe of uh, 1986, and uh, at that time, uh, a lot of people were shocked uh, of uh, of the silence uh, from Moscow regarding this catastrophe. And uh, yes, for a lot of Ukrainians, uh, the times of uh, Gorbachev uh, were about. Uh, uh, the freedom, the freedom of press, uh, more public activities of non-governmental organizations, um, the gaining of independence of Soviet Republic. But at the same time, uh, that uh, six years uh, were a period of, uh, of the oppression uh, of republics, for example, uh, in Lithuania in January 1991, also uh, in Georgia in 1989, uh, and uh, also other ethnic uh, uh, ethnic violences uh, took place during Gorbachev's period of uh, rule of Soviet rule, and um, his uh, death uh, is uh, is a very interesting. A moment because uh, we saw that uh, a lot of Western leaders uh, from European Commission, other countries, uh, they wrote a very emotional letters of remembrance. Yes, Gorbachev um, gave uh, a peace and freedom to Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, he ended the Cold War. And so uh, he was probably the best uh, Soviet leader because he gave uh, the freedom to his people. But uh, for me, as a historian of colonialism, it's very important to understand that uh, Gorbachev uh, didn't complete the process of decolonization of Soviet Union and Russia itself. Because uh, during the late uh, 80s, uh, it was the activization uh, of uh, movement uh, of historical reconstruction, uh, of remembrance of uh, the white movement, of uh, the rena re renaissance of Russian nationalism, of Russian chauvinism. So that's why uh, this uh, uh, 
wide window of opportunities, uh, it was different uh, for different uh, nationalities. Yes, uh, uh, for example, uh, academic uh, physician Andrei Sakharov, uh, he became uh, free uh, during uh, the Gorbachev uh, time uh, and uh, there were some kind of first open elections in the Soviet Union, but uh, Gorbachev, uh, uh, he was uh, like uh, a soft uh, version of Russian imperialism. And when we speak about uh, Gorbachev and the West, uh, we have to remember that uh, uh, he was considered as a man uh, with uh, whom they can make his business. We can remember the historical uh, speeches of Margaret Thatcher, of Ronald Reagan, and other Western leaders. But for example, when we speak about Margaret Thatcher, I want to emphasize about the role of uh, uh, Ukrainian Stefan Trulecki. Stefan Trulecki was the advisor of Margaret Thatcher, and uh, he was a conservative MP uh, in the mid of 80s and uh, when it was perestroika in the Soviet Union, Trulecki told the Thatcher that uh, Russia is an imperial state in uh, having any form of political power. Tsar Russia, communist Russia, new Russia. And uh, at that time, uh, not so many politicians uh, in the West uh, uh, understood uh, it uh, and uh, that's why at some point uh, this uh, misunderstanding uh, of uh, Russian internal politics and uh, Russian policy uh, towards uh, neighbor countries uh, this misunderstanding uh, caused uh, the current uh, instability and uh, caused a lot of war. And uh, Gorbachev, uh, uh, well, he was uh, a truly Russian uh, reform leader because all his reforms, they were, uh, they were not completed. We can speak about, for example, Russian Tsar, uh, Alexander II uh, and uh, his uh, abolition of serfdom and his military reform, uh, his uh, uh, judicial reform, uh, his uh, reform of local governments, uh, we can uh, and we can speak also about uh, Nikita Khrushchev uh, as the other example of uh, Russian. Uh, uh, reformist, uh, but in all these cases, uh, Alexander II, uh, Khrushchev, and Gorbachev, uh, we can see one very important uh, scene that uh, all these leaders they provided reforms only to improve the, their empire because uh, the reforms of Alexander II uh, they have helped uh, to. Uh, Kolonka, the Central Asia, for example, and uh, to uh, have uh, more power in the Balkans. Uh, the reforms of Khrushchev, when we speak about the decolonization in general, the reforms of Khrushchev, uh, they have helped uh, to form uh, such image of the Soviet Union abroad, especially uh, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, uh, those regions uh, which uh, gained the independence from the European metropolis, uh, Khrushchev uh, have formed such image of Soviet Union as the sponsor of uh, these oppressed nations. And uh, that's why uh, during the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, until the end of the Soviet Union, Moscow became the main sponsor for these states. Military aid, financial aid, economic aid, uh, aid through advisors, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, 
uh, that's why Moscow and Moscow uh, it means Russia for them and Soviet Union it it means it means Russia for them not uh, not the 15 uh, national republics but only Russia and uh, the current uh, challenge is uh, what we see regarding the Russian Ukrainian war in the global south they have uh, the direct uh, uh, cause of that events because uh, Moscow for a long time uh, provided uh, these uh, countries with their aid, uh, with their information policy, with their uh, with their vision of the world. Uh, that's why uh, uh, Moscow anti-Western uh, uh, rhetorics uh, have helped uh, to get. Uh, the Russian support uh, uh, in Africa, for example. And of course, and... Uh, to jump in, Gorbachev is widely credited in the West with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, with taking apart the Soviet Empire, but that wasn't his intention. I mean, he didn't set out to uh, destroy the Soviet Union. He didn't set out to give Ukraine independence at all, did he? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, Gorbachev wanted uh, to make uh, some uh, some reforms, uh, like to um, to make a prior heavy industry, for example, auto automobile industry, so to uh, to be more co competitive with the Western economies, uh, because Gorbachev. Uh, clearly understood that the uh, Soviet plan economy uh, can't handle uh, this uh, uh, with the other economies. And so uh, his uh, intentions were to make uh, the Soviet regime uh, more liberal, uh, but at the same time uh, uh, less... Uh, less oppressive and to have you know like uh social and with the human face uh, which was very popular during the 60s and uh, gorbachev's reforms uh, their main aim was to establish uh, such image of soviet union as uh, you know the important partner and uh, so that uh, the moscow M moscow uh, foreign policy wasn't uh, formed uh, through class uh, divisions and uh, it was formed uh, like the new vision, uh, uh, the new Soviet uh, foreign policy main aim was uh, to have, you know, uh, the, the, different, the different partnership with the world. And uh, when we speak about Ukraine, uh, during... Uh, that Gorbachev's uh, ruin, uh, a lot of uh, dissidents uh, have uh, returned home and uh, Crimean Tatars uh, have begun uh, to return to the Crimean Peninsula, uh, which, was, uh, at that, which was at that time since uh, 1954 the part of the Soviet Ukraine. And uh, all of these uh, cultural NGOs, uh, they, they formed uh, the platform uh, uh, na national, national Movement of Ukraine, Narodny Ruch Ukraine. And uh, the National Movement of Ukraine, uh, since uh, 1989, uh, it became the main platform for all uh, Ukrainian dissidents, writers, uh, all future politicians. And, uh, but the turning point uh, for Gorbachev in Ukraine was uh, obviously Chernobyl catastrophe because uh, it was uh, the disaster for all uh, Soviet information policy, because a lot of people understood that uh, uh, 
uh, Moscow was just lying to them uh, that uh, they uh, had uh, to go on the demonstration uh, on on the, on the Khrushchev Street on the first of May on the uh, International Day of Workers. Uh, so it was absolute collapse of uh, the political power inside the Soviet Union. And uh, for a lot of Ukrainians, Chernobyl became uh, the the turning point uh, that uh, the Soviet power is not the Soviet Union is not their country and uh, Ukraine uh, is needed to become the independent state mm-hmm. and uh, when we speak about the mid 80s the late 80s uh, um, the public support uh, uh, in the West uh, for Ukrainian independence was not so big. Uh, I've mentioned uh, Stefan Trilecki uh, in the UK. Uh, also, uh, we have to remember about uh, uh, Yaroslav Stitsko. He was the head of anti-Bolsheviks uh, uh, movement. Uh, he have met uh, with um, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick. Uh, she was the first uh, woman, uh, US, the US envoy to the United Nations, and uh, Stitsko have met with her in uh, 1982, and uh, also uh, uh, behind uh, them was uh, Katrina Chumachenko. Later, she will become uh, uh, the wife of Viktor Yushchenko, the future president of Ukraine. And uh, so uh, the Ukrainian diaspora in the United States of America, in Canada, in the UK, uh, in Germany, France, uh, it was not uh, so powerful. And uh, local politicians, they uh, didn't see and they didn't support the movement towards the Ukrainian independence. There were several reasons for this. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, Gorbachev was uh, like the main uh, politician for them. Yes, if Gorbachev will uh, sign uh, the documents to have less nuclear weapons, uh, to open the Soviet Union for foreigners, for foreign business, to liberalize the economy, uh, that's why we can, uh, they, uh, their logic was that they, that they could uh, make the business with him. Uh, the second reason uh, was that uh, the Soviet propaganda was very powerful and uh, the main image of uh, Ukrainians uh, in uh, especially through the cartoons uh, in uh, such uh, magazines as uh, Crocodile, Pepe. Crocodile was uh, in Soviet Union and Pepe was in Ukraine, a local uh, magazine with cartoons. And uh, in that cartoons, uh, Soviet people could saw Ukrainians as only betrayers, uh, uh, in the West, uh, they are collaborators with uh, uh, German neo-Nazi, uh, so they support uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, they support BBC, so enemies' voices, so like Ukrainians abroad are very bad, were very bad. And... Uh, so this propaganda was truly very powerful, and uh, and uh, there were not so many information actual about Ukraine abroad, like how people live here, uh, what is the situation with the economy, with the social structure, ethnic tension, and so on and so on. Uh, but when we speak about the late years of the Soviet Union, a lot of uh, foreign leaders uh, have visited uh, Ukraine uh, in the June of 
1990 Margaret Thatcher uh, visited Kyiv. Uh, uh, she uh, has uh, told the speech uh, in the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, the Ukrainian parliament, and uh, she told uh, very clearly that uh, you don't need uh, the independence uh, and uh, so that's why when uh, Dmitro Pavlichko, Ukrainian poet, asked her, uh, will uh, Britain will open the embassy in Kiev? And uh, she replied to him that uh, the Great, uh, Great Britain uh, uh, doesn't have the diplomatic relations with California or Texas. Um, and uh, in 1991, uh, there were also two very important visits. The first one was in June. Um, German Chancellor Gelmut Kohl visited Kiev, and uh, he also was not a big promoter of Ukrainian independence. Uh, uh, and uh, George uh, Gerbert Walker Bush. Uh, uh, he visited Ukraine on the 1st of August in 1991, just the days uh, before the declaration of Ukrainian independence. Uh, it was his famous Chicken Kiev speech. Uh, Chicken Kiev is one of main Ukrainian uh, meals. Uh, uh, and uh, he told about the disastrous Ukrainian nationalism. So everything was bad when oh Ukrainian nationalism no 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 only we work with Gorbachev only the support of renewed uh, union renewed federation uh, and that's all like uh, the West uh, didn't uh, expect there were not so many expectations that. Uh, uh, such a powerful state as the Soviet Union could collapse uh, within uh, months. So uh, and it's like the war this year, isn't it? I mean, a lot of analysts yeah, yeah. So, have got so, that wrong as well. Yeah. So, and uh, you see that all these politicians in the West uh, they uh, didn't know. Uh, so many facts about Ukraine, they didn't understand uh, the Ukrainians, and uh, and uh, 30 years ago, uh, Ukraine uh, couldn't have, uh, Ukraine didn't have uh, so much resources to provide, you know, to have its own public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, media diplomacy, uh, there were big problems with the establishment of embassies around the world. Uh, and, uh, however, the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Ukraine uh, uh, have had uh, its own uh, diplomatic service uh, renewed in 1944 during the Second World War. But the ministry was so... Uh, was so there were so not so many uh, people who have been working there and one very important fact about uh, uh, for example the USA and uh, Soviet Ukraine in uh, 1972 Richard Nixon uh, have visited Kiev uh, during his uh, Soviet trip uh, mm, and uh, at that time, uh, they've agreed to establish uh, uh, not embassy, but like pre embassy in local in Kiev. Uh, and it was very interesting uh, that uh, American diplomats uh, who uh, have uh, begun to work in Kiev to establish uh, this, all this stuff. Uh, they've uh, started to, uh, to 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 study uh, the history of their predecessors because uh, in 1917 uh, there were some American diplomats uh, in uh, the Ukrainian National Republic, and in 1970s American diplomats they 
uh, they've written uh, the official request to the Institute of History of uh, Ukrainian Soviet Academy of Sciences. And, uh, but the Afghanistan uh, affair of Soviet Union and uh, the Moscow Olympiad, uh, they've uh, crashed all these plans. However, people have worked for almost 10 years and uh, in 1992, uh, the full American ambassador was established in Kiev. Uh, that's, uh, you know, one page uh, of white history so that uh, it was not so many informations and uh, foreign uh, diplomats and foreign politicians, they were at some point very, um, they wanted to to know the country where they they have been working at that time, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Gorbachev and decolonization. So uh, Gorbachev's policy towards uh, uh, Soviet satellites in Central and Eastern Europe uh, um, it was uh, it was not so popular. Uh, this democratization in the Soviet Union in the Eastern Europe, uh, but in uh, 1989 uh, there were velvet revolutions, and so uh, at some point uh, peaceful transformation of power occurred, and uh, the Soviet um, uh, the Soviet influence in Africa. Uh, it was lowered, definitely lowered in, in the 90s. And uh, since 1991, uh, Russia uh, wanted uh, to regain uh, its control uh, in so-called post-Soviet space. And uh, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, we can uh, speak uh, that period of time that uh, the formation of Russian uh, Eurasian geopolitics, Alexander Dugin, the most famous one and other uh, philosophers, historians, mm. and other. And still called the architect of the uh, Ukraine war. Yeah, yeah. And so. Uh, um, in 1993, it was uh, one very interesting article published. I can't remember the name of his author, but anyway, uh, the logic was following that uh, uh, the whole Russian history was concentrated uh, only on uh, having the influence in Europe, in the West, uh, all these encounters, wars, and so on and so on. And uh, but uh, it was a very important region uh, for Russia, Siberia, the internal colonization of Russian uh, space. And uh, in 1993, uh, it was very clear for some Russian intellectuals that the main region in which uh, Russia would need uh, to be dominant is the Eastern Europe, like this bridge between Russia and the West, because this, uh, like the Baltic states, Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, all this Eastern Europe. And uh, during the 90s, uh, there were two Chechnya was, uh, and uh, uh, Russian, Russia didn't have uh, so much uh, military power to, to provide the annexation of some Ukrainian territory. Yes, uh, it was the Transnistria uh, campaign in 1992 in Abkhazia, in southern Ossetia. Uh, but Ukraine was uh, the main goal for Russia. Why Ukraine? Uh, Ukraine uh, was uh, the second uh, regarding uh, the economics uh, and other 
statistics, the second republic in the Soviet Union. That's why Russia wanted to have the access to all these resources, to all this territory. And uh, I, I remember, so I am uh, uh, 31. Uh, I remember when I was a child, uh, there were only uh, Russian pop songs uh, on the television, and there were not so many uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian media or Ukrainian books. So uh, uh, Russian Russian plan uh, was uh, truly strategic uh, in uh, in becoming the dominant uh, in the information space of Ukraine. And uh, and the decolonization uh, inside the, the Russian Federation is also a very important topic because in 1991, at the beginning of the 90s, there were also some active movements in Tatarstan, in Kalmykia, in Buryatia, in, uh, in all these either Muslim or indigenous uh, the territories inside Russia to uh, to have the autonomy within uh, the Russian Federation, and uh, they've got it, uh, but uh, they've lost it uh, when uh, Putin uh, became the president uh, of Russia in 2000. So to an extent, uh, I mean, to jump in and, and ask a question here, um, the last thing about Gorbachev to mention, of course, is that his legacy, yes, he 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 was still in that sense a Russian imperialist, but he was in favor of um, a more free press, glasnost, and so on. His legacy is in complete ruins now. It's destroyed, isn't it? Because the Russia of Putin seems to be much closer to the 1930s than the 1990s. Well, uh, Gorbachev's uh, Gorbachev's glasnost was uh, truly very decisive. Uh, that uh, for people that they uh, got to know about the Stalin repressions, about uh, the famines, about all these tragedies of uh, Soviet collectivization and. Uh, mm, and during the late 80s, uh, the society was not uh, so uh, so good oriented. They didn't have the clear vision for their uh, of their future because uh, previously uh, previously people used to get to know. Okay, I will go. After the school, I will go to the factory, or I will go to the university, or I will go to the army. And so my uh, future life was uh, was visible. And uh, when all this, and, and when, when, when people uh, have got uh, the alternative uh, sources of information uh, in the press, uh, or on the television, and all these problems with uh, the drugs, the prostitution, uh, the other social problems, uh, they've, uh, they've transformed all uh, this uh, society, and uh, Gorbachev was the man who who just uh, let it happen. So not all uh, processes uh, inside the Soviet Union uh, were directly connected with uh, Gorbachev's policy, um, because we have to remember about the opposition uh, against uh, Gorbachev. His main rival was Boris Yeltsin, who who decided uh, to uh, among uh, among the nomenclature who was the first who decided to left the communist party it was uh, not so popular among nomenclature um, staff uh, so and uh, 
this rivalry between uh, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, um, it was very it was very important uh, to in, in providing more liberties for Soviet people. But uh, former Soviet people, uh, they uh, became uh, more vulnerable to uh, different uh, manipulations, uh, you know, regarding business and so on, so on, all this MMM in the 90s. So all this... Uh, all these guys uh, who predicted the future from the TV set uh, and so uh, and they didn't have the critical thinking and maybe it was the biggest problem for Soviet people not to have the critical thinking because during the Soviet time uh, 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 my grandfather was a communist, uh, he was also a man of nomenclatura staff, and uh, while being communist, he used to listen to Radio Free Europe. I mean, Soviet people, they, uh, they knew that, first of all, it was official position, and secondly, uh, it was real life, and thirdly, something uh, what they could uh, hear from some radio or from abroad. And so people have had at some point uh, different uh, different dimensions of reality. Yeah? And when uh, this alternative uh, and uh, alternative positions uh, they became more and more you know, visible, they were just totally lost. And so uh, during the 90s, the biggest challenge for, for Soviet people uh, was to have the critical thinking. And what is, uh, and what is crucial uh, uh, for Ukraine uh, at that period is that uh, mm, we've had uh, had the different presidents. So yes, there were some oligarchs, there were some problems with the economy, um, but at the same time uh, there were democratic elections, uh, presidents have changed, and uh, we didn't see such, uh, such processes in Russia, because uh, in Russia uh, during the 90s, it was a very interesting uh, process uh, so that uh, uh, former KGB guys, uh, security services, intelligence services, and uh, contemporary mafia, uh, they formed the alliance. And uh, this alliance of KGB and mafia they've created the phenomenon of Vladimir Putin because uh, uh, as being uh, the former KGB guy, uh, uh, he have got uh, the access to the resources. Uh, working in uh, uh, St. Petersburg, former Leningrad. And so not all people uh, inside the Russia uh, and also in the West, they've understood it. So that uh, this uh, mm, alliance uh, is very dangerous mm. for the whole world. And uh, the result, the results of this alliance, we can see now the different wars, uh, uh, the military involvement, the Russian military invo involvement in Africa through Wagner Group, uh, uh, we can see it uh, through the disinformation via Russia Today, Sputnik, and all other uh, Russian state uh, uh, media. Uh, so uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, we didn't see such, uh, such processes. Yes, uh, the oligarchs have formed uh, during Leonid Kuchma and uh, Viktor Yushchenko presidencies, 
but uh, we didn't see such uh, powerful uh, uh, such uh, we didn't see such powerful former KGB guys. Yeah, it was uh, Yevgen Marchuk uh, who was a former KGB guy and who was uh, the prime minister in the mid nineties. But uh, uh, in Ukraine, we didn't have uh, the KGB guy uh, as a president. And what I was keen on exploring as well is your knowledge about post-imperial, post-colonial Britain. Now, we talked before the interview, there are some parallels uh, between, say, uh, British imperialism and even English nationalism uh, and Russian. But the, the, the Russian imperial mindset is, is sort of on steroids. It's a, it's a hundred times more intense, isn't it? But is there anything we can learn from the, I would say, relatively peaceful decolonization of the British Empire? I say relative because there was still an awful lot of chaos and, and bloodshed and disorder. Um, and that process wasn't done, say, in India uh, perfectly by any means. The Middle East sought up a huge amount of problems for the future. Um, but nonetheless, Britain didn't collapse and there wasn't widespread you know, civil war across the empire. Is there anything that the decolonization of the Russian empire can learn from um, that British experience? So when we compare British colonialism and Russian colonialism, especially in the 19th century, so the British colonialism uh, was uh, oriented towards gaining power via private companies, for example, Ost India Company or other companies. And uh, but Russian colonialism was internal colonialism. All these uh, territories uh, which uh, Moscow have conquered during the 19th century, they were near Russia. The Caucasus, Central Asia, Finland, Poland, and the uh, Russian Empire uh, have seen, for example, Central Asia as truly uh, the indigenous aborigines, like uh, the same as British did in Africa with uh, killing a lot of locals, uh, with, uh, with doing truly genocide at that territory. And, uh, and British Empire, uh, British Empire have started uh, since the beginning of the 20th century to think about the strategic planning, strategic development uh, in the economy, to have you know some experts, to send some experts to the colonies, to uh, have the real situation. And it was very important, uh, especially in the 1930s, when there were disturbances in the British West Indies, some revolts in other colonies. In Russian Empire, uh, we we couldn't see such uh, tendencies because the economic the economy as uh, as a part of state was formed only when Alexander the Third the Third was uh, the Russian Tsar. It was in nineteen ninety one in. 1881, 1894. So the late 19th century, when uh, in the British Empire, you know, it was truly a big industrial power. And uh, when we compare, for example, uh, serfdom and uh, slavery, slaves. Uh, they were the private property for the British, for the British uh, colonizers. And so uh, for Russian aristocrats, they were not people and they, 
they were they were not officially like uh, people in that country and uh, and, and and it's really truly very interesting that uh for example african americans in the united states uh, have got the their rights in the 1960s and soviet peasants have got their passports also in the 1960s 1970s so the process of this decolonization of this emancipation of of oppressed uh, uh, peasants of oppressed uh, groups it was parallel the lessons what we can uh, learn uh, so that uh, Russia didn't have the strategy how to how to give the independence to its uh, former parts of empire because in in the either 1917 or 1991 only big chaos and big revolution could uh, could uh, broke uh, the Russian imperial power. In the British Empire, we didn't see such tendency because, uh, first of all, uh, all this, uh, uh, the situation in the regions was, I'm sorry, the situation in the regions was different. For example, when we speak about uh, the Middle East, it was, uh, the East of Suez policy in the late 60s, so the British just withdrew its military bases from the Middle East and from Southeast Asia. And uh, in Soviet Union and in Russian Empire, mostly in the Soviet Union, we didn't see such tendencies because, uh, for example, um, in Ukraine, uh, the Russian Black Sea Fleet uh, was uh, all the period of Ukrainian independence. And it was the one uh, big uh, topic for Russian-Ukrainian tensions all this time. Russian decolonization uh, could uh, become uh, complete uh, only when uh, all uh, former its uh, parts uh, could uh, become truly independent mm -hmm. in culture, in politics, in economy. And uh, when Moscow decided to form uh, this uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, SNG, um, it wasn't the same as it was the Commonwealth of British Empire. Because uh, Russian uh, uh, Russian language uh, became toxic, and after uh, Russification, uh, you would have uh, Russian tanks on your streets. And uh, I, I can't I can't say that Britain uh, wanna try to regain its power. In Africa, for example, it's it's it's, it's like the, the main uh, difference between Britain and Russia is the mechanism of uh, between metropolis and uh, the colonies, and also uh, Great Britain uh, tried uh, to to control the process of decolonization. Yeah, it was uncontrolled in very ways, but uh, Russian decolonization uh, is uh, the main association with Russian decolonization is only chaos and revolution mm -hmm. because without chaos and revolution, the mm -hmm. Russian decolonization won't be possible. And so that's why when we have the full-scale Russian-Ukrainian war, the real decolonization when uh, the people in the Russian Federation could get the autonomies and when they could 
could become truly free people. Uh, only after this we can speak about the decolonization. And also uh, the decolonization has uh, the three dimensions, uh, politics, economy, and sociocultural part. And when we speak about social cultural part, uh, um, Russia uh, continued uh, to to weaponize its uh, language, its culture, and uh, in Ukraine, uh, almost all people have understood uh, that. Uh, we don't need uh, to read, uh, to, to study Russian authors uh, at school. Uh, we don't need to study Russian language at school. Uh, and for me, it's uh, impossible not to study English language in Nigeria, for example. It's, it's, imp it's totally impossible. So uh, Russia, uh, is uh, manipulating its soft power like uh, if you wanna uh, if you wanna study Russian language yeah you have to start because it's the language of uh, the most famous writers Leo Tolstoy, Fyodor Dostoevsky and the Russian language is not connected with what uh, uh, Vladimir Putin is doing right now in Ukraine, and it's very, you know, uh, it's very crucial to understand that um, Russia is uh, sharing such narrative that uh, it's uh, only Putin's fault uh, this Ukraine, uh, this uh, war in Ukraine. It's not the uh, fault of ordinary Russians, it's not fault of Russian society, it's not fault of uh, the whole Russian Federation. It's only Putin's fault. But guys, who have elected Putin for several times? And Russia, over 20 years. I mean, Russians I've spoken to make the point that it's very difficult to protest now, and that's understandable. Uh, now it's almost too late to go onto the streets. It's almost too late to develop a political and civic society. But what happened over the last 20 years? I would say, well, that was the time. 2014 was the time to develop a political consciousness, to go out on the streets to resist Putin. Um, but, but, you know, that didn't happen on any great scale. Um, and to summarize, I think I think your point of view could be summarized by, and this is a very crude summary, that the process of decolonization in Britain was a conscious, messy, but a conscious effort. And Britain was able to turn its soft power, its culture and its language to a binding force rather than a weaponized force. Whereas Russia is not decolonizing consciously, quite the opposite. Wherever it has the opportunity, it is seeking to recolonize. And those instances where Russia has decolonized, for instance, Eastern Europe and Ukraine's independence, it was almost accidental, riding a kind of wave of history, not a conscious effort. Have I sort of understood that correctly? Yes, Jonathan, you understood me very clearly. So. Uh... During all these 30 years, uh, Russian politicians, they've been speaking that Ukrainian independence is a mistake. It was just an accident, you know, uh, we are the brothers and so on and so on. So uh, Russian decolonization is, uh, is a very complex process. And when we speak about the political decolonization is in my point of view, the autonomy for Muslims and in, in, in indigenous people, and uh, also uh, the, uh, the 
deoccupation of Ukrainian territories and also the withdrawal of Russian troops in Moldova, in Georgia, in Kazakhstan, in all former Soviet republics. Because only having uh, no Russian soldiers on our territory, we can build our future on ourselves. Mm. And, and uh, I mean, the last question, because we're going to have to uh, to end shortly. My last question here is: the Soviet Union collapsed accidentally. It collapsed very, very quickly, and many analysts weren't predicting that would happen. Is there a chance? that the Russian Federation itself could collapse into a series of autonomous regions, even though most analysts at the moment would say that's a very low possibility? Well, as of now, I think it's uh, impossible because uh, uh, we have to remember about the Chinese factor and China... Mm, does, doesn't need uh, some uh, independent states, for example, in Siberia, because it would be very useful just to have the economic influence there. Mm, but I want to predict that some uh, uh, ethnic violence could happen very soon, uh, especially in the Northern Caucasus. Because almost a quarter of uh, Russian population are Muslims, and mm. all these ethnic tensions is uh, is like you know a, a fight, is like playing with matches. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. Well, Ihor, thank you so much. I really appreciate you spending sort of so much time uh, speaking to me today. These are incredibly complex issues, and this has been really enlightening speaking to you. Um, and uh, Slava Ukraini. Slava. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It was a pleasure for me to speak with you on very important topics.